Next up on This Week in Law, Brandon Butler, Gus Hurwitz, Sarah Pearson, and I will talk about the Ninth Circuit's Garcia case and performers owning the rights to their performance. Romeo, Romeo, what are you doing with Romeo, TiVo? We'll try and figure that out. We'll talk about the Mad Men finale. We'll talk about vinyl and stuff on a plane, all next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Sarah Pearson and Denise Howell. Episode 304, recorded May 22nd, 2015. Just don't touch music, man. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting and invoicing solution that can help your law firm and any small business save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash twill. Hello there, I'm Denise Howell, and you're joining us for This Week in Law, where we talk about everything that is interesting and complicated and sometimes mind-numbingly confusing, confusing yet very important at the intersection of technology and law. We're going to do our best to keep it from going into mind-numbing this week, for sure. We've got a great panel of folks. They're good at explaining things and understanding things, and that's what we'd like for you to be able to do once you've concluded your time with us. Uh, introducing you to our panel, we've got Brandon Butler returning to the show. He is the practitioner in residence at the Glushko Samuelson IP Law Clinic at the American University Washington College of Law. He also teaches copyright law there. Hello, Brandon. Great to have you back. Hello. It's a delight to be here. It's a delight to see you. I'm so glad you've decided to join us al fresco. It's quite lovely in D.C. right now, as we can see. Yes, it's wonderful. I couldn't resist. I, I almost had a beer, but I thought, I don't know. I thought I'd stick <laughs> oh, with water for now. Yes, feel free. It's Friday. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, also joining us uh, from more of the midsection of the country where he teaches telecommunications and cyber law at the Nebraska College of Law at the University of Nebraska is Gus Hurwitz. Hello, Gus. It's great to be here. Um, uh, first time participant, unlike Brandon, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's great to have you. Uh, we should also let folks know you don't only teach cyber law and um, telecommunications. You you have a very strong economics background. You teach law and economics as well, and also the principles of regulation, which sounds like a fascinating course. Yep. Regulation. So I uh, have econ and I also have a bit of a tech background before law school. Wonderful. And also uh, from her lair in the med section of the country is my co-host, Sarah Pearson. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Denise. I'm having some connectivity problems, so no uh, video right now, but I am here. Oh, dear. Well, we're glad you're here. Hopefully we can get your video back and uh, because it's always great to see you, Sarah. So I'm glad you're here with us and uh, let's get into it. There's a lot to talk about this week and a lot of it uh, comes from my neck of the woods in Southern California, a lot related to the uh, entertainment industry up the road in Hollywood. In fact, there was kind of a funny line in uh, the Kaczynski dissent to the Garcia case, which came out with, from the Ninth Circuit today that had to do with, um, he was uh, invoking the music man, I think. Uh, we've got trouble right here in River City, and uh, he's talking about uh, the circuit being right here in Hollywood City. Um, uh, Judge Kaczynski uh, is the seems to be the lone dissenting voice on uh, the ten judge panel that decided that uh, Cindy Lee Garcia, after her long uh, back and forth in the courts, is not going to be entitled to um, have Google take down the innocence of the Muslims video that she acted in. Uh, she, we've talked about her case on the show a number of times. Um, it's a fascinating case because it, uh, 
looked like if uh, the Ninth Circuit's original decision had stood, it was going to stand for the proposition that actors and actresses own a separate copyright in their performance uh, that could enable them to, as Ms. Garcia attempted to do here, um, have some control over the final piece in which uh, they acted. Poor Cindy Lee Garcia um, was duped into appearing uh, in the film uh, where she appeared and uh, was uh, made to say some offensive anti-Muslim things that was never part of what she signed up for. Um, so while she may have some legal claims against the people who are involved her against the film, uh, a, a takedown uh, copyright-based takedown against Google, uh, according to the en banc panel, uh, panel, panel <laughs> of the Ninth Circle. <laughs> I'm doing really good. <laughs> Circuit. <laughs> um, a a copyright-based takedown is not one of them. Save me here. Someone, uh, Brandon, jump in. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, this is such a fascinating case. Um, it raises, you know, these sort of existential questions about copyright. What does it mean? What are its fundamental, um, <clears throat> what are the fundamental subjects of its protection? Um, but actually, the first thing I want to do, uh, say about this case is to flag something that I think is the, will end up being maybe the most important and durable aspect of the holding, which is that the, the court's discussion of what is the relevant harm for purposes of an injunction of getting a preliminary injunction under the Copyright Act? Um, so Miss Garcia, of course, had some substantial harm that she was worried about. You know, there was a fatwa against her. Um, she feared for her life. That's as harmful as it gets, and that's what that's what Judge Kaczynski sort of ends his dissent saying, you know, saying exactly that. It is her life after all. Um, but and that, that's, that may be part of what makes this such a compelling holding. The court says, well, protecting your life is not what copyright is for. Copyright is for protecting your work of authorship and your right to commercially exploit that work of authorship, right? And so the court, we can, we can get back to that more fun question about whether there's a work here and who's the author of it and so on, and that's all very interesting. But what may end up being the most interesting thing is one is the the court's narrow uh, conception, and I think right rightly narrow conception of what the harm is that copyright cares about, and the harm is copyright harm, author harm. And Cindy Garcia, for whatever else she's concerned about, she's not protecting a copyright interest here, and so the court says, "Sorry, you don't get an injunction." Yeah, if I can uh, jump in, please do. Uh, yeah, I just want to really emphasize um, what Brandon said. Uh, this is about the injunction question. Um, and mm -hmm. the underlying harm here wasn't related to, so there are two parts here that are important to emphasize. First, the underlying harm wasn't related to the copyright. And also you need to have a, you need to demonstrate the harm in order to get the injunction or a likelihood of success. Um, and the unclear nature of the copyright uh, claims makes it really hard for the court to sustain an injunction at this point in time. We shouldn't overread this as saying anything substantive about uh, the nature of the copyright claim. Uh, I have not in a long time seen as much discussion amongst copyright um, uh, professors as I've seen over the last week as a result of this case. There are really fascinating, really existential questions about the nature of copyright in multi-party works that this case is raising, but the court's opinion doesn't or shouldn't be read um, as really getting to those. Well, it is uh, a good invitation to have existential discussions about um, copyrights in multi-part works, but it seems to me the music industry has been having those discussions for years and has uh, a very Byzantine approach to how its rights are uh, managed. As, as the result. And I'm wondering if the two of you think that we're headed for something like that, if, if this uh, case is an indicator. Judge Kaczynski certainly feels strongly that actors and actresses have a copyright interest in their performance. Again, hearkening back to 
the music industry where performance rights are a whole separate and valid and enforceable, monetizable thing. Um, do, you, do you think that we'll see a shift um, toward rethinking copyright law because of the existential issues this case raises? What do you think, Brandon? I don't think so. Uh, I think this case, um, and, and Gus is right, this is a case about, this is a case that is at the injunction stage, and so we shouldn't think that the substance of what the court says about copyright is, you know, as, um, as compelling as it would be if this were squarely about that issue. Um, still, I think what the court did was essentially side with tradition. So, I mean, the, the majority opinion essentially said, well, look, we know what work is at issue here. The work is the movie. And we know who's the author of the movie. It's the director. Actors aren't authors of movies. End of case, right? I mean, that's, there's a lot more nuance to it, of course. But that, in some sense, is the bottom line. And so for, for recording artists, I think the situation will be the same. It would be, you know, look, there's a business here, and that business is run using, as you said, Denise, like Byzantine contracts and expectations. And we all know who the author of a sound recording is. And, and that, I, I don't expect that to be, uh, I don't expect that to be upset by this. Now, if Kaczynski had one, then we'd be in chaos. I mean, it's sort of ironic for Kaczynski to be the one giving a parade of horribles kind of a, a rationale for, you know, why you should side with him because the horribles are much clearer uh, if you do side with him. I mean, it would just upset lots of expectations about how copyright works. Um, you know, the, the thing that's interesting here too is that the court really, and, and Ms. Garcia and Kaczynski and, and everyone involved in the case has focused on whether or not there is a work here, but, and I know, I think Gus is probably on the same copyright professor listservs that I'm on, and I've been watching this unfold, and I think one thing that's emerged as a consensus among the scholars is that the court probably could have solved this more easily if it had picked this up by another handle, and if it had said, you know, it doesn't really matter what the work is, we know that no one can be a joint author of a work unless they are, uh, unless they intend to be a joint author and their other joint authors also intend for them to be a joint author. Um, this case would start to look a lot like some of the other joint authorship cases like Al Muhammad V. Lee, the Malcolm X case, where Miss Garcia would say, hey, I'm a co-author of The Innocence of Muslims. And the director would say, no, you're not. And the court would side with the director probably for the same reasons that the court sided with Spike Lee in the Al Muhammad case. Um, that might have been a cleaner way to do this, and I think that's the way it would happen in the future. Yeah, that, that seems right to me. Um, the thing that I would add, there are a couple of fascinating questions about how this case was brought and what other possible claims could be brought. Um, so it, it's uh, there's a broader nexus of rights to personality um, and uh, rights to control your reputation. What happened here, could uh, Ms. Garcia have foreseen that her line would have been dubbed over? Probably not. Uh, that's not a copyright issue in all likelihood, but she probably has, she may have other claims against the producer. Um, uh, it's interesting to note that there's a relationship between Section 230 and 512 here. Why was this framed uh, as a copyright issue to get it taken down from YouTube? Well, because you can do that. Um, th YouTube would have no liability under Section 230 um, if this weren't an IP claim. Um, in all likelihood. So you have that issue um, lurking there in the background. Uh, so there, there are a lot of interesting issues um, about how this case was brought, why it was brought the way that was. In terms of whether or not uh, the rules, the law, the legislation might change here, I, I agree that not in the near term. Um, I think that there could be some unsettled, really interesting questions that ultimately get addressed either through the courts or legislation. Um, I'm thinking back to a couple of months, maybe sometime in the last year, there was the video, it was an anti-science video um, that uh, Kate Mulgrew, depending on your perspective, either Red or Captain Janeway, um, was uh, uh, used <laughs> She uh, read a bunch of script for it. She didn't know what this video was going to be used, and the producer cut and pasted her lines into a video that was um, extremely problematic from her uh, perspective and the perspective of many others. Um, is that a copyright issue? I don't think so, but 
that could be something that in this modern era where it's easy to cut and paste and construct someone saying something that they don't believe um, could be addressed uh, by the courts. So this is Tara. I wanted to jump in and um, kind of confess to having been just being continually, I guess, a little bit confused by um, this notion of who owns the copyright in a performance. And I feel like I'm almost more confused after reading the court's <laughs> opinion about fixation. So the court said that fixation, you know, they cited that you have to, the fixation has to be by or under authority of the, of the author. And to me, that says, um, you know, that makes it pretty clear that someone who unsuspectingly, uh, you know, has a performance and some, they don't know that they're being recorded, they don't have a copyright interest in that recording. Um, but what it doesn't answer is the question of like here, um, or, or say uh, like Martin Luther King, for example, I don't actually know if, if his speech was written down beforehand, but I've always wondered, um, if it wasn't, uh, would he, does he have a copyright in the, because of the fact that it, you know, his performance of the speech was captured if, if that was the fixation, if the fixation happened at the recording, which he, you know, it was under his authority, presumably. Um, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know. It, I don't know if, if Brandon or Gus, if you actually know the answer to that question, but I continually kind of, uh, grapple with that one. And I feel like the court didn't really answer it very well. The court, the court's answer, as Kaczynski pointed out, that can't be right. Can it? I mean, that just because the person wasn't holding the, the, the camera, that can't be the question of whether or not you own a copyright in the, in the performance, can it? Wow, Sarah, I, before they answer, and I'm sure they have good answers, I really wish you hadn't just planted in my brain the image of Dr. King holding a selfie stick out in front of him to record his speech. <laughs> just go <laughs> forth, Joe. <no. laughs> right, right. And if, if Kaczynski were right, that would be your legal advice to Dr. King, right? You know, before you go up there on the stage, you should, you should record your speech yourself with your own, you know, fingers on the, on the record button. Um, I, there, there certainly is an answer that is, of course, you don't have to literally record yourself. Um, and that's what by or under the authority of does. Under the authority of means if I'm Tom Petty, I can say to the recording engineer, all right, buddy, hit record, here we go. And that doesn't, and I still own, I won't back down or whatever, right? And I can later on right. take some of Sam Smith's money too while I'm at it. And I apologize for the barking dogs next door. Um, so the thing that's interesting though is that a performance per se, of course, before it's fixed is not protected by copyright. It's not a fixed thing. and. And we actually have law on this for musicians. Section 1101, the anti-bootlegging provision, uh, creates a non-copyright. It's, it's a right that's created under the Commerce Clause, a right for performers to, uh, to enforce their interest in their performance against a bootlegger who makes a fixation without their authority. And so, in some sense, Cindy Lee Garcia is the victim of bootlegging, right? Because she, she, her consent was fraudulently obtained, and so she never really consented. And so the fixation, if she, if, even if, assuming she's an author of her performance, um, the work itself wasn't fixed under her authorization. And so she's a victim of bootlegging, but of course, the bootlegging provision is limited to musical performances. Um, and... So she's out of luck. That's another reason I think she's out of luck. Um, now, there is, in fact, an international treaty, the Beijing Treaty, that the U.S. is a party to, but we have not ratified, that would create a kind of right in performers. It's very ambiguous what that right would be or how it would work. And, and would, it, would it have helped Cindy Lee Garcia um, is an open question. But I think that's, that's what's going on here is, you know, there's no such thing as, a, as an unfixed performance that would be vested in a copyright. So we have these weird semi-copyright rights like 1101 and Cindy Lee doesn't get one. So she's out of luck. I wonder if any of you know the answer to this. Coming at it from my perspective as an internet lawyer and websites are constantly um, creating joint works through their um, user submissions and getting a license to do so uh, in writing. Um, I'm wondering why Cindy Lee Garcia was not shut out um, simply by the terms of her agreement 
to sign on to this film um, that now we can argue about whether she was um, induced into uh, agreeing to something that should be tossed out because of the misrepresentations that were made to her about what her performance would consist of. Uh, but leaving that aside for a second and just thinking about the entertainment in industry in general, don't um, filmmakers contract with talent in such a way that they're, in addition to um, simply signing them on, they're getting a license to whatever intellectual property interests uh, a court might construe them to have? Uh, Gus, do you know the answer to that? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know a definite answer, but I would say that any contract is only as good as the lawyers who are involved in its drafting. So I would expect moving forward, um, Kate Muldrew's lawyers are probably going to make sure that she's dealing with uh, better uh, drafted contracts. I would expect mm -hmm. that uh, sophisticated producers are going to uh, address these issues in their contracts. But what about the uh, Miss Garcias of the world? I don't know how sophisticated uh, the producer of uh, the innocence of the Muslims was, I uh, expect that uh, this entire issue could have been avoided and would have been avoided had there been a better contract in place. Brandon, any thoughts about uh, dealing with this in the fine print? Yeah, the um, I think that's one of the reasons this is such a strange case and why I think it'll be rare is the fraud element is what sort of upsets everything. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Contracts and if not contracts, then you can, of course, without a writing, uh, give a non-exclusive license. That's what the other big case that was precedent for Garcia, the Effects Associates v. Cohen case, that's what that case said. Uh, mm -hmm. If I give you a, a, a reel full of material and it's understood that you're going to put it in your movie, then I've given you an implied license to put it in your movie, even if we didn't sign anything. So if I show up on a film set and I stand in front of a camera and somebody says, action, I'm in a movie and I knew that and I'm an actor and I know the rules of the game and, and there will be an implied license that will probably cover it. It only gets tricky when when there's fraud, when there's something that would undermine that expectation. And perhaps the word the word fraud might not be the right word. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, there, there could be fraud, in which case it uh, becomes a much easier case. The really tricky part, which arguably we have here, is where the actor is manipulated um, in post-production into doing something that the actor or actress didn't uh, expect that they were doing. Um, because with technology, we can now do that. That doesn't seem to me like it should be addressed by copyright, but it seems to me like that is a serious um, issue that uh, we should expect to see uh, more of moving forward. And what are the rights um, of individuals um, in those cases? Right. That seems like a, a hard point to negotiate. If you're an actor or an actress, you're going to want in your agreement to appear in a film um, of any kind, you know, web distributed or otherwise, uh, some sort of assurance or final approval of the finished work to make sure that you're not being portrayed in a way that upsets your expectations. But what director, film producer is going to give actors and actresses a sort of final cut right? I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, Sarah, any thoughts on that? Um, no, I agree with you. I can't imagine that that, they're, that any director is going to consent to that sort of control um, on the part of the actors. I guess I had one question, um, well, for both of you, um, about Kaczynski's dissent, and I guess maybe particularly, um, Brandon, since you were tweeting about you were tweeting about it, so presumably you spent more time with it than I have. But I wondered what you thought of um, his point about how the court uh, talked about um, whether or not the contributor had joint authorship in the full work, the movie, and how that is a very different question than the question of whether or not the contribution itself would be co copyrightable on its own. And it seemed he was making the point that maybe the court conflated those two things. And I wondered if you thought that was, if that had any merit in your eyes. Yeah, I was, uh, whew, that, I'm a little embarrassed by that tweet now. I was, this is the <laughs> yeah. danger of live tweeting as you're reading something, right? <laughs> um, so the more I let that, the more I let the dissent sink in, the less I thought it was so silly. Um, and, you know, you can multiply scary examples of, of you know, and he, as, as he did, of sort of a, a draft chapter or, you know, deleted scenes. Um, 
but I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm not, I guess I'm just not worried about those, those situations. I think those are, I think he might've been misreading the majority opinion. I don't think the majority was literally saying there's no work and no protection until the final cut comes together, which I think is what that, that was the, that was the thesis he was attacking that, you know, until you've got the final edit, um, nothing is a work. And so no one is an author and nothing is protected. And that all does seem sort of on its face silly, which makes me think it's not what the majority opinion means. Um, but that's, I, I'm not sure I could say much more than that. Yeah, that's fair. All right. I well, say, I just thought, go ahead. I, I, one more thing though. It is worth saying, uh, if you look back at Al Muhammad and, um, and also Childress, but more Al Muhammad. Uh, the the Malcolm X film case about the script consultant. I think there may be answers in there to the question of you know is an actor going to get final cut you know rights on a on a movie um, for good or ill. I think if you, if re read between the lines or maybe even on the face of that case, it's been a little while since I read it. Um, I my takeaway was that a lot of the question of who is an author will be decided in part by power and convention. You know, who is the author is a question about who is deferred to as an author, who is considered an author. And, you know, as you both observed, no director is ever going to let an actor get final cut on his or her movie. And that, I think, is going to be part of what a court is going to look at and say, well, then you're not an author. You're a participant, but you're not an author. Now, Brandon, the question might then become, will the court say with great power comes great responsibility? Um, you can't manipulate the author. You can't manipulate your actors um, if you have that power. I don't know if they'll do that, but uh, that uh, could be the approach that either the courts or Congress takes in response to situations like this. All right, since we keep talking about the final cut, uh, we'll put our first MCLE passphrase into the show, and that's going to be final cut con. Uh, <laughs> little play on words there. Um, it, we put these phrases in the show in case you are listening for continuing legal education or other professional education credit uh, and you need to verify that you actually watched or listened to the show. These are little Easter eggs to uh, be able to show, yes, I did. There, I know the phrases. So um, if you need more information about that, head on over to the wiki uh, for Twit. That's at wiki.twit.tv. Find our show there. And we've got a whole um, rundown of information on uh, MCLE credit in the United States and how you might use this show to um, help you meet those requirements with great folks like Professors Hurwitz and Butler. Um, you can see, I think this is educational. Um, certainly, uh, I learn a lot every single time we do this show. Uh, let's move off of um, Cindy Lee Garcia and on to Aereo, or perhaps a reboot of Aereo, this time coming from TiVo. Uh, TiVo apparently picked up uh, some of Aereo's assets, its, tra its trademarks and customer lists. And now it has announced that by midsummer, uh, so not too long from now, we should see some resurrection of an Aereo type service where um, subscribers can get live television broadcasts on a subscription basis, uh, this time coming from TiVo, who says they're going to do it legally this time. So we don't really know how that's going to work. Uh, we do know that it's going to be called Romeo. And uh, so that is coming. Um, I guess the question then that this raises uh, to our wonderful panel is how we think that might be coming. How will TiVo avoid Aereo's disaster? What do you think, Gus? I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, only so there, there are two ways I can think of maybe this works. First is contractually. If um, mm -hmm. TiVo actually manages to get contracts for this uh, content, yeah, they can do that. But that that's not going to happen. Um, the mm -hmm. other possibility, and uh, I'm getting this from uh, what is actually on the box. I don't know if you can flip back to the uh, web page that you just had up there. Um, it says uh, HD antenna DVR. The only thing that I can think of is uh, that they're going to sell a device that uh, is a DVR with a bunch of HD antennas in it that is constantly recording every channel that you might want to watch. Um, so it's kind of taking the Aereo model um, where you have a warehouse full of antennas 
and moving that warehouse into your own home. Um, that's pure speculation on my part. I cannot, for the life of me, see how they would actually do this legally. Um, for a, a reminder for everyone, um, the there are uh, two um, hurdles that uh, they would need to overcome in order to be able to do this legally. Um, uh, without getting contracts. First, they would need to get the copyright office um, to say that uh, this is a cable service, which maybe could happen with an asterisk I'm going to return to in a moment, in which case they could avail themselves of the copyright statutory license. But the only way that the Copyright Office is likely to do that would be if the um, Federal Communications Commission also regulates this as a multi-channel video programming distribution service, um, in which case uh, they would need to get retransmission consent from the broadcasters. Um, so they would still need to get contractual permission uh, in order to avail themselves of the uh, compulsory license for the underlying content. Um, so uh, unless they've managed to negotiate a lot of deals or come up with yet another uh, technological um, uh, epicycle, uh, I can't imagine them doing this. Gus, what if they tried to drive through the, the delay loophole? that uh, the Aereo decision left open, where it's the contemporaneous retransmission that, that was pro problematic. What if they built in a slight but sufficient delay? That would be fascinating. Um, uh, I'm really excited that you brought that up because mm -hmm. uh, you're right, the uh, Aereo decision did leave open uh, uh, that aspect of uh, the Cablevision decision, if there is a delay, if it's not contemporaneous. Um, and that begs the question, what is enough of a delay? What does contemporaneous mean? Um, mm -hmm. And we don't know. Um, there's no definite answer to that. I would expect, um, and uh, thinking like an academic, oh, I should write an article that says this. Um, <laughs> I would argue that the way we should think of what is contemporaneous is a sufficient period of time for any given program that would uh, not dilute the, uh, the commercial value value that program. So for nightly news, um, perhaps the next day, that would be fine. For a live sporting event, perhaps 15 minutes, that would be fine. Um, for network programming, if it's a weekly show, it might be the next week that you would need to have a delay. Um, so it's a, a, an interesting question that if they do go that route, um, lots of articles will be written and uh, this will definitely get litigated. Uh, and I will confidently predict that there will be an unsatisfactory outcome. <laughs> there generally is. Brandon, what do you think about all of this? Can you think of other ways that TiVo might try and crack this nut? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think uh, I love I, I love it when economists talk. I love I love the uh, the thinking about what's important in terms of um, what would hurt the market. I think it's clarifying the um, the the thing that's interesting to me that I see a few things. One is that. As you said, there could be a delay loophole. And for TiVo, right, I mean, TiVo knows better than anyone that at least it was a cliche. Uh, it's been a cliche for years that nobody even watches live TV half the time anymore, although there's increasingly sort of event television that you've got to watch live so you can tweet about it live and talk to your friends about it as, and immediately on Facebook. But outside of event TV... Nobody watches TV live anyway. And so TiVo may say, look, we know better than anybody that that's where the real money is. And so, yeah, we're going to take advantage of that loophole. And the delay doesn't even have to be, um, we don't have to futz with, is it a few seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, 10 minutes? We'll just, as soon as the show is over, that's, that's time shifting and we'll, 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 we'll litigate that version of the case. So that's one thing they could do. The other thing is that the FCC has opened up an inquiry into whether they should change the definition of MVPD, multi-channel video program distributor, which is the category that Gus described earlier, that's essentially cable companies, um, to allow for quote unquote cable companies, you know, type for that would allow for cable company type of entities that would um, uh, come over the top. Uh, on via internet transmission, and they would transmit streams of essentially live TV. Um, and what's important about the main thing about MVPD, as I understand it, we in the clinic were involved in this proceeding a little bit, and what our clients cared about was that part of what happens once you are classified as an MVPD is that the content folks have to 
negotiate with you on good faith and reasonable terms or something like that. There's some very vague language in the FCC regulations about MVPDs. Um, but basically it means they have to give you sort of a fair shot. And their hope is that part of this MVPD rulemaking at the FCC will be uh, ensuring that content providers like the networks really do sit down and, and deal in, in good faith with people rather than shut them out. And if you want to know why that's important, look at Hulu and how crummy it is, right? When, you, when, when the networks get to decide what you get outside of the broadcast and cable context, they give you nothing that's that great. And so you really do want some kind of regulatory interference or some kind of disruption in order to, um, in order to create a new poss a possibility for a useful business model in this space. And that um, good faith negotiation requirement, um, a interesting idea or thought that I had back in the fall when a number of the content providers started putting their uh, network content online, um, I was hypothesizing back then, and it would be interesting to see how this plays out, that part of the reason that they were doing that was to define the terms of other contracts on uh, friendly grounds, because the FCC will probably look to other deals that the content owners have negotiated in uh, trying to think about what constitutes good faith. So uh, that could have been why we saw back in the fall a number of the networks suddenly putting content online. Um, and in a bit of defense of Hulu, I have to say, they have the best selection of classic Doctor Who and old Top Gear episodes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think, doesn't Netflix have every single Doctor Who ever made going back to the 60s? I think they only have the classic uh, collection. It's about 100 ah. episodes. Uh, Hulu has them all. Wow. Mm. All right. Um, that's on my to-do list, of course, to watch them all some someday <laughs> when I have, I don't know, I, I suppose I'll have to have some debilitating injury, so I'm not wishing that on myself. Um, where did I want to go with this? Oh, um, DLR in uh, IRC uh, is making me think that we need to sort of describe a bit better um, even though TiVo hasn't given particulars as to how this will work. Um, he asked if, he or she asked, if TiVo is only using the home device to record off the air, I don't see the problem, no need, no delay needed, but that's not what we're we think we're talking about here. Uh, what we think we're talking about is a service where you're not already subscribing to the cable or satellite TV programming in another way, that you're using the TiVo device as your subscription to a certain number of channels. So it's not going to be recording anything for you. It's going to be the delivery device for your home. Um, does everyone agree that that's what we're talking about here? Well, I'm honestly I, not sure. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Brendan. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I, we, of course, we don't have any idea what they're going to yeah. do, but, but I will tell you, we wrote, the clinic intervened in the area and, um, and related cases all over the country for the last couple of years. And one mm -hmm. of our arguments was um, that the alternative to Aereo is buying a box and putting it in your house. And that's, there's nothing about the Aereo holdings that have any effect on uh, the possibility of buying a box like the one pictured, the TiVo Romeo box, and putting it in your house and operating it yourself. Um, there's no question that that's a private activity, that's a private performance. Yeah, that box, that box, you can buy it and put it in your house mm -hmm. and, and just use it. And the, 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 the content would be delivered over the air. Um, as Gus was saying, you could use right. a standard antenna and tune in all the channels. You could just put multiple tuners in there and have them all running simultaneously, just like you do with a cable box. Um, but our argument was that's expensive, it's inefficient, um, it's environmentally stupid because those boxes are some of the biggest power hogs um, of, any, uh, of any electronic device in your house. Um, and so why should folks who get their TV over the air be stuck with a box in their house while people who buy cable get the Cablevision uh, remote storage DVR as a solution? Um, but the answer is because we lost. And so... <laughs> So since we lost, since we lost in the Supreme Court, I think that might be the safest option is to sell us a box that we put in our house. Right, and but that box they, is really not. Bought. That's not in addition to a cable or satellite uh, subscription. It is your antenna. It is in lieu of the rabbit ears. Exactly uh, on the or TV or may, on. That's right. exactly right. Or you may need an antenna 
But then you mm-hmm. just plug the antenna into the box, and the box has the tuners in it that will isolate the signals and, and record them for you. Um, right. And antennas are cheap. Um, but what, you know, all that all that TiVo bought, by the way, was the brand name, the trademarks, and the customer lists. So it's mm-hmm. not necessarily the case that they care at all about the technology. Um, it's just that they want to brand it, brand themselves as Aereo and reach out to former Aereo customers and see if they can get them to switch. Yeah, in fact, um, in the fall when this uh, transaction was all happening, it's a lot of folks were saying TiVo's most, uh, not TiVo, uh, Aereo's most valuable asset was its brand name. So that, that could just be what TiVo has really acquired here. Sarah, were you going to chime in? You know, I was just going to ask a question. So I feel like we've talked a bit about the, the question of what's, public and what the Aereo case said about the public part, but I wondered if one of you can remind me at least, and probably other, hopefully other people out there don't remember as well, like what's, we were, we were talking about how a delay might be, that there was a loophole for delay, and I can't recall what the copyright, um, like what, what's the copyright piece associated with the delay, like what is that specifically hinging on? Do either of you want to remind me? I have a cynical answer. (laughs) (laughs) The cynical answer is the real reason the Supreme Court decided the way it decided, and this isn't this isn't cynical. It's in the it's in the opinion, is that Aereo just looked too darn much like a cable company, and you know they didn't want to get slapped down again the way they had been after Fortnightly and Teleprompter, Um, and so a delay is is weird enough that it doesn't quite look like a cable company company anymore. I honestly don't know of a principled reason why the performance is no longer public just because it's a delayed performance. Um, but it's less cable-ish, and so maybe that's... <laughs> the- what did they pretend the legal argument was? Does anyone remember? Because I don't... I know I read it at the time, but I just don't remember off the top of my so head. They, they didn't get into the issue. Um, they okay. uh, decided um, that this looks too much like a cable system. It's a cable system, therefore that ends the matter. Um, gotcha. Uh, there was some language there uh, discussing the delay, but they didn't decide anything. So when we say loophole, we shouldn't read this as the court said a delay makes it all okay. We should read this as right. um, a delay was previously understood to be okay, um, both with time shifting and uh, the uh, com- uh, the uh, CSC, um, cable vision opinion. Uh, but the court didn't say, and if there is a delay, that means that this is okay. Okay. Right. Gotcha. That's helpful. Thanks, guys. Well, one thing that I have delayed doing is um, catching up on Mad Men such that I would be able to watch the finale that just happened. So Mm -hmm. this is going to be interesting for me to discuss because um, I don't want to spoil the whole series for myself. But we're going to talk about this anyway. We're going to talk about the Mad Men finale and the fact that I don't think, um, you know, unless you've been under a rock and if you, like me, don't want to spoil the show uh, for yourself. You might want to stop listening right now because I'm going to tell you that even though I haven't seen it, I understand that the Mad Men finale involves um, Don Draper being involved with an iconic Coca-Cola commercial um, dating back to my childhood. Um, so again, uh, haven't seen it. Uh, interested to see it once I finally catch up on a couple of seasons. I think I'm a little bit behind here. Um But the interesting uh, copyright and legal aspect of the finale involving a tie between Don Draper and this iconic Coca-Cola commercial uh, is apparently nobody went to Coke and uh, got permission for any of what was included in the finale. So now I will turn to others on the panel who hopefully have seen the finale. Uh, (laughs) Brandon, you uh, highlighted this and I think it's fascinating. Um, Did they actually air the commercial as part of the finale? They sure did. They really did. They they showed the commercial. I think it, I don't know that they showed the whole thing, but they showed a a lot of it. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, it was, you know, it ran for a pretty good while and, um, and yeah, they didn't pay a dime for it. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, well, how, do, how does that all work? I mean, obviously, um, the trademarks uh, come into play, too, as something um, that, you know, oftentimes big brands like Coke will clamor to have their brand appear and actually pay to have their brand appear in a show like Mad Men. Um, and, you know, I don't know if any of that went on behind the scenes 
Uh, but apparently the, the party line from Coke is, uh, we had no idea of the involvement uh, of the brand in the finale. There's a really interesting article in the Daily Mail um, about how some of this was prefigured as the show has gone on and unfolded. And there have been Coke references uh, that have come in at different times that, that might tip you off that Coke was going to have play a bigger role later on. Um, I, I don't know, you know, maybe those were product placements. I have no idea, you know, what went on behind the scenes here, but uh, is this fair use, Brandon? You know, how, how did they get to do, do this? Yes, it is fair use. Okay. Um, and what's interesting, though, is uh, I think it wasn't going to be clearly fair use before the Carry UV Prints case came out recently. Um, or at least, you know, it, it all depends on how you read the episode um, under pre Carry U case law. Post Carry U, I think, and, and of course, Carry U is only Second Circuit case law, but the Second Circuit is a leading sort of copyright circuit that lots of people watch and defer to. Um, post carry you, I think we're pretty clearly in fair use territory. Um, what's going on here is that the commercial is being used in a completely different way from its original way, right? It's being incorporated into a piece of narrative television. It's playing a key part in the plot, um, which I won't spoil for anyone. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's clearly doing something very different from selling Coke, right? And under Carry You, that's enough. Under Carry You, we, we, we tested this question of whether uh, the artist Richard Prince, who had appropriated photos of Rastafarians in order to make these um, noisy, kind of uh, large, garish, postmodern paintings that were, you know, the Rastafarians with lots of paint slopped around on them and so on. And the, the question in that case had been, you know, well, if Richard Prince has no intention to criticize Patrick Carey or to criticize these photos or, you know, is, if, what must be the content of Richard Prince's message in order for this to be fair use? And the district court said, well, he had better be commenting on the original photographs that he took. If he's doing anything else with it, that's not fair use. Fair use requires, you know, commentary on the thing that you took. And the Second Circuit said, no, oh, no. If you're using it in, in a different way for a different reason, that reason doesn't have to be in reference to the work that you took. And so before Carry You, we might have said, gosh, if Mad Men isn't making fun of Coke or making a commentary on Coke, then we're not sure if this is fair use. But I think after Carry You, it's clear that it's fair use because it's just different from the Coke commercial. And it doesn't have to be about the Coke commercial. Although, of course, I think you could read it that way. We could get into that. But, mm -hmm. but after Carry You, they're clearly safe in a way that before Carry You, they might not have been. What I think is interesting is I completely agree with you that it's, um, you know, they're using it as part of the, you know, it's a narrative hook. It's, it's part of the story. But because everyone, at least I, completely assumed that Coke had paid for it and that it was product placement, in some ways it's, it's almost like they're using it you feel like they're using it for a similar purpose to the ad because it feels like an ad the way it was used. Um, and again, I won't, I don't want to spoil the ending, but um, <laughs> it's cl they're clearly putting it in, they're putting Coke in a positive light. Like it, it feels kind of like an advertisement. So in some way, some weird way, it's kind of like, like they're not using it for a completely different purpose. I, I know that they are, but I, I just think that's kind of interesting that, you know, it feels like a product placement. Um, yeah, if I can yeah. put my economist hat on for a moment and uh, I'll start by saying uh, I spend all of my time watching old episodes of Doctor Who and other 80s era BBC shows so I've not seen uh, uh, <laughs> any of the recent uh, seasons of Mad Men so no spoilers coming from me. Um, uh, I think that the discussion of trademark and fair use is very interesting uh, but uh, from an economic perspective there's also something really interesting going on that Sarah hints at and uh, the party line that I've actually seen from Coke is that they knew about this. They knew that something was going to happen with their um, uh, brand. They didn't know what, but they knew something was going to happen and no money had exchanged hands either way. And I think that whether or not that's true, we don't know. It could be um, a uh, post hoc ra rationalization, but they want to try and address the concern that Sarah just raised, that they don't want this to be 
uh, paid advertising. They don't want this to be paid placement. And I wouldn't be surprised, given how visible it was, if uh, they had some really savvy lawyers say, hey, you know what? Let's not pay for this. If they want to do this, it's great. And let's not taint the positive effect um, of this by paying for it. Yeah. I agree a thousand percent. It's earned media, right? It's, it's right. you know, Matthew Weiner thinks we're cool. What's better than that? Now, the thing that undermines all of that is I think they're making fun of Coca-Cola. Um, I, I, I don't <laughs> right. want to spoil anything for anybody, but I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that advertising is, you know, a dubious enterprise. And um, a big theme of the show has always been that Don Draper is this really thoughtful, you know, troubled existential dude who nevertheless makes his living by selling people stuff they don't need and, and how does he live with himself and what does that mean to him and so on and so forth. And I think at least one reading of the ad and to me the best reading of the ad in the show is that it echoes that theme again. It's, mm -hmm. it's just more proof that Don Draper can only be authentically human in scare quotes in the context of a cheesy ad selling sugar water. Um, <laughs> So it, it, right. to me, it's a total diss on Coke, but they don't know it. And they maybe they don't care because whatever, any, if, if Don Draper looks sideways in your direction, you get lots of money in pop culture. So who cares mm -hmm. what he's saying about you? But now you're contradicting what you said before, where, um, that it's not commentary, I th but I think you're right though, that either, yeah. that there is definitely a reading there. So it's, it's either that there, there's some element of commentary on Coke, which I I think that's correct, but or you know the opposite, the more superficial, I guess, take on it is that it's it's a product placement. It's great publicity for Coke, and either one, they're you know they're kind of in the clear. Well, I think it has to be commentary on some level because the commercial, and I remember it vividly. It was just such you know for anyone who grew up in the early '70s, you in the United States, you knew this commercial, and and its message was of hope and coming together and youth and the future and, you know, all of the, all that is good and right with the world, right? And to have that coming from Don Draper, I think there's no question that that is commentary. <laughs> so, and even though I haven't seen the show. So, um, I, I think that the fair use problem, the fair use argument probably has a couple of different ways to, um, get itself made should it have to be, but it doesn't sound like it's going to have to be, which as Brandon was saying at the beginning is just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to one last uh, copyright related story before we shift gears into some other topics. Um, and this I think is fascinating too. And again, just gets into the thickets of uh, law that are specific, to, laws that are specific to certain media and the medium in question here is the phonograph record, uh, the kind that you put on the turntable and put a needle on and play. Um, there was a Kickstarter uh, company called Vinyl, V-N-Y-L, uh, that raised a bunch of money, um, three times as much as its stated goal, uh, and then decided uh, and, and got written up in the press. I don't know if it touted itself with this moniker or if this is just something that uh, it was called and it, it wound up being helpful in its marketing. But it was um, thought of as the Netflix for vinyl. So, um, you know, like Netflix in the old days when you used to actually have DVDs delivered to your house. And yes, I know people still get DVDs delivered to their <laughs> houses. Um, this was going to do the same thing for, for vinyl records and as, as it was touted on Kickstarter. But it turns out that the company, after um, closing its campaign and getting down to the hard work of actually delivering services to customers, learned of a little thing called the Vinyl Record Rental uh, amendment of 1984 that prevents you from creating a Netflix for vinyl. Um, so they pivoted their business model and just started sending records out to people. And the people who received them, uh, thinking that if they didn't like them, they could send them back, took to Twitter and social media and the Kickstarter page and said, okay, so great. Uh, this one I don't like, I'd like to send it back. And there was no way to do that. 
Um, so they've, they've failed on a couple of fronts. First, in doing their legal homework on the front end. Um, secondly, on not having clear communication with their customers. Um, how, what else, Brandon? <laughs> Sending them crummy <laughs> records. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's a big problem? I, you know, I, like reading between the lines, I said this on my blog post. You know, if I had to guess what happened, it looked to me like the, the founders of vinyl uh, happened upon a fire sale of cheap, crummy records <laughs> and bought a lot of them. And then they spun that into, you know, we've got all these records you've never heard of, but that you, that you might like. Tell us what your musical tastes are and we'll send you something that matches up with your tastes. And, and all the stories in that Stereo Gum article, at least, are people saying, you know, well, I like, you know, list five cool indie rock bands. And then they get, you know, some forgotten 70s folk artist. And it's like, well, yeah, this guy plays an acoustic guitar, too, but this stinks. And so and then so that really compounded the problem. You know, not only could they not return it, but they wanted to return it really badly because it was. <laughs> <a> <laughs> yes, yeah, this, exactly. This is a. Uh, th this is the sort of case that I love to talk with about with my uh, students, because mm -hmm. what it seems like happened here um, on the legal side is someone remembered uh, this first sale doctrine and said, oh, let's run with this. We can uh, rent out these um, uh, records. But they didn't go back and actually look at the statute. Um, they didn't remember uh, Section B, which says you can't do this with phono records and computer software. Um, uh, so they knew enough of the law to think this is okay, but they didn't do the due diligence of actually going back and making sure the law says what they remembered, and you always got to do that. Really good lesson for lawyers. <laughs> well, and it seems like it's it's a good topic not just um, for knowing the permutations of the law, but the fact that a 1984 law still can come back and bite um, a Kickstarter company on its hiney today. Um, that this might be something that your principles of regulation class would would deal with as well, uh, Gus, because uh, it really seems like to make, you know, the policies behind this distinction, whatever they may have been, have probably gone by the wayside with the way that marketplace, the marketplace has uh, treated vinyl, um, the fact that it sort of waned and now is coming back again. What do you think about right. that? So uh, one of the interesting background points here is there's a lot of discussion about technology neutrality and copyright law and also generally. And this is clearly a non-technology neutral law. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it, it, is, it is not just about vinyl. It's about phono records, um, which are sound recordings, um, and it's about computer software. Now, 1984 was a very interesting time. So 1984, uh, first we didn't have CDs, so that's uh, part of why uh, it, it used that terminology. 1984, that's when Sony was being decided. That's when the VCR was new. Um, Blockbuster Video opened in 1985. So certainly a lot of these issues might have been on the mind of Congress. Um, the lack of technology neutrality here is notable. Um, and I've not researched uh, the legislative history here, but I expect there are some fascinating stories to be told about the emerging video industry um, and why uh, the uh, different technologies were being treated differently. I do believe that uh, this act was uh, enacted out of concern of music piracy in specific, um, and also the emerging uh, uh, software trade. Um, but uh, it, it's a fascinating story, a fascinating period in history, and it raises great questions about technology neutrality and how uh, and whether the statute makes sense over time and whether or not it makes sense to have statutes uh, like this that get uh, fixed in a tangible, let's call this fixed in a tangible medium of enforcement um, that perhaps should only be there for a, uh, a shorter period of time. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems a little nutty. Uh, Brandon, Absolutely. you sound like someone who, who signed up to get some Morrissey delivered to you and got the new seekers instead. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. There's a lot going on here. Another thing that's funny about it is uh, is uh, it tells you 
it just reiterates, I think, a rule that lots of VCs follow, which is just don't just don't touch music, man. <laughs> like the, the copyright, <laughs> copyright act and the litigiousness of the players. You know, if you, if you if you find some really nice business model that works in some area, and you think you can just do that, but with music, you should think again. Um, because it's, there's, there's going to be some landmine in the law that very successful lobbyists were able to create, or there's going to be some very rich and angry rights holder. Um, and, and so this is why innovation in the music space is really hard to do. Um, another thing, uh, that's interesting about all this is that, um, the the home it reminded me of that old home taping is killing the record industry campaign that yes. happened in the eighties. I wonder if this was part of that. You know, there was that great icon of the cassette tape with the crossbones underneath, and you know, home taping is killing the record industry. And the Dead Kennedys had an album that they put out in the eighties where side A had music on it and side B was left blank, and it said, "Home taping is killing the record industry, and we left this side blank so you can help." <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the uh, same thing. I wonder if they almost, you know, in 1984, as they were attacking the VCR and then and they happened, you know, they were successful with this legislation. I wonder if now it's actually biting them. Because you can imagine that there, there might be a market for this sort of business of uh, renting vinyl records, but you can't. <laughs> People can't make businesses around it. So I don't know. It is kind of funny to think about whether this came back to bite the, the rights holders. Right. Reverb Mike in IRC has been asking, well, how is this different from borrowing a, a record from your library? And I answered him back, well, it's the rental, the money changing hands. That's that's the issue here. And he's, he's then asking, so how is it different from a local video or a music rental store? And, and the answer is it's not. You can't have a rental store that rents vinyls because of this um, provision. You can sell them all you'd like. Uh, you can give them away, but you can't rent them. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, a strange little quirk. I just saw them for sale in Barnes and Noble the other day after uh, the Tower Records down the street from me is because the old building that used to be a huge Tower Records um, is now becoming a Walgreens pharmacy and Barnes and Noble is now selling vinyl. So I don't know. The world has <laughs> so that I, I, just, I, I just had a crazy idea pop into my mind and this is dangerous, really dangerous off the top of my head thinking. But what does it mean to rent? So a lot of um, the online uh, music stores, they don't sell you the uh, music. They only license it to you. Is that a lease of some sort? Is that a rental? Now, I expect that the answer is that's contractually allowed. So we're not in the first sale sort of regime. But uh, it, it's an interesting, perhaps, a set of ideas to juxtapose because we do, in a sense, have music uh, rental with some of the um, uh, online music stores today. Yeah, that opens up a whole other can of worms, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. We could just well, stay on copyright all day. Could, we could. And I, I want us to be able to move on. But the last thing I wanted to say was the alternative that I mentioned in my blog post is trading and facilitating mm -hmm. trading. So yes. I mentioned that old service, Lala, which I was a part of uh, in, the, in the early aughts uh, when I was in law school. And, mm -hmm. um, and you could basically, rather than Lala being the central holder of all the CDs and sending them to you a la Netflix, all Lala did was create a database and you would tell them what you have and someone else, someone else would tell Lala what they have. And if there's a match between what you have and what someone wants, Lala would facilitate the trade. And so it could feel in some sense just like Netflix for vinyl if they facilitated trades between people who own records. Um, I want somebody to make that business. Gus can jump in here because he's the economist. I've just recently started buying records as opposed to MP3s. I've had this kind of like first sale um, come to Jesus moment and I really want to own stuff. And so I'm buying vinyl, but it's so expensive. I buy much less music now than I used to. Um, if I could rent vinyl or somehow get my hands on it for less, man, that's a business somebody should get into. You've been spending too much time with Aaron Perzanowski, clearly. Yes. He also <laughs> is a record buyer, I know. Gus, do you think someone would actually challenge uh, or could make some kind of challenge um, to... Uh, let, let's spin out what you said a second ago uh, a bit. 
Um, suppose someone decides, you know, they, they have had it with the terms of use of iTunes and uh, Kindle and everything else that says you're only renting this media that we're providing you with. Um, and they make some sort of uh, ownership stand. I'm not sure exactly what they would do, um, whether it's try and resell the works or um, otherwise um, exercise rights that only an owner would have. Um, and iTunes or Amazon or whomever comes after them. Do you see them arguing perhaps under this provision that uh, their whole the whole business model has to fall because you're not allowed to rent these kinds of media? So first we need to recognize that this is limited to um, phono records, uh, so sound recordings and um, computer software. Um, mm -hmm. It probably, uh, and we should also say, yes, this sort of question about first sale in the online domain has been litigated and successfully. Uh, the mm -hmm. Autodesk case, when we're talking about uh, licenses versus products being sold, the licenses, um, uh, if they are properly constructed, uh, they govern. And it is not a sale that you have, it is a transfer governed by license. Um, in terms of could this take down um, the uh, Amazons of the world, I, I think, uh, and I always get muddled up. I'm, I'm trying to remember the details of the terms of service. I think iTunes now uh, is no longer giving you a revocable license. Um, but uh, could this ultimately throw a uh, wrench in the cogs of some of these services? Perhaps if the lawyers mm -hmm. weren't thinking about uh, this provision, it would depend on how the uh, reseller was getting access to the media. Um, are they acting as a reseller, meaning they have purchased a copy that they are reselling, or are they acting as a distributor on behalf of the copyright owner? Uh, then uh, there isn't the first sale question that gets implicated. Right. All right. To be continued on that one, I think that's that's an interesting uh, can of worms you just opened. Um, let's move on and uh, talk about Google's can of worms in the EU, uh, the right to be forgotten, which is now a year old. So um, other than it being a year old, I don't have that much to um, talk about uh, the right to be forgotten. I just want to see um, what people's impressions are. I have some stats I'll taught at, toss out there uh, that Google has gotten more than 250,000 requests covering 920,000 links um, in the year since the uh, court in the EU uh, directed Google to start honoring uh, requests for people to have links taken down. There's an interesting Wall Street Journal article that talks about uh, the, the sort of star chamber that Google has put together of lawyers and policy people in the UK um, who get to make these decisions um, and how some of the decisions are very easy and the example that they cited um, was somebody's shoplifting lifting offense that happened years ago. And um, some of the decisions are difficult, um, including uh, more heinous crimes, but committed by a younger person. And um, so uh, Google continues to grapple with this. And uh, it's, of course, very different than um, the situation we have here in the U.S. Uh, Sarah, any uh, thoughts or pontifications on the right to be forgotten a year into this uh, process in the EU? Well, I think I'm a little bit of an outlier in that I am actually pretty, I'm sympathetic to the idea behind the right to be forgotten. Maybe I'm not an outlier. I don't know. Um, you read a lot of criticism about it. And, the, and I think the criticism is justified in the sense that we don't want companies to, we don't want to leave these decisions to corporations, um, especially without, you know, with such little guidance, it seems like uh, we've given little, you know, very little parameters, or not we, uh, the EU gave very little parameters to Google about um, what what the right to be forgotten means and um, those lines. And so there are lots of easy cases, but then there are, a, I imagine, a huge chunk of really challenging questions that balance these really important issues of privacy and speech. Um, and it's, it's, just dangerous to leave these ideas or to, to leave these decisions to companies. I think we don't have transparency about how the decisions are made and, um, you know, just a whole host of policy problems about, about leaving that kind of uh, control to, to Google. 
as much as, you know, they may be well-intentioned about what they're doing. It's just a kind of a dangerous situation. So guess is, is the response to that, that we need specific regulation or the EU does to give companies like Google guidance? I'm really not sure. Um, I have a lot of trouble with the right to be forgotten, not because I think it is the um, wrong approach. Um, I actually think that something like the right to be forgotten is very likely the future of the Internet. And this takes us, in a sense, back to the uh, Garcia um, case, uh, where you have things that are uh, able to be done in the online uh, domain, which are harmful to individuals' reputations. And uh, it ultimately takes us to a European view of privacy. I think in the long run, uh, the European view of privacy is frankly much more developed than the American view of privacy. That said, when I put my uh, um, economist hat on and when I uh, think of my general philosophy, uh, I don't want regulation over um, uh, privacy substantially. Um, I uh, sometimes uh, in my crazier moments uh, like to uh, embrace the uh, Posnerian view of the 1970s and 1980s uh, where we should have markets in all information um, and we should just embrace the market approach. Um, so I'm really uh, uh, conflicted over the right to be fraud forgotten, though I do expect this is the general direction that we are moving. And I've got no idea how we're going to get there. I've got no idea how we're going to actually make this workable. Um, it is the, oh, uh, the, there was a recent article about how Google is dealing with this, the group of executives getting together weekly um, to try and uh, make the right to be forgotten decisions. Um, the most amazing thing about that to me is that it does seem to be working at some level. Um, and I think a lot of the expectations are this would not scale. Well, we're seeing that it might not be efficient, it might not be great, but there might be workable ways for companies to actually meet these obligations. And as they this process solidifies and grows more mature, um, then we might see uh, greater uh, clarity, greater consistency in the actual regulations that uh, can evolve. There's one more stat from that article I want to um, pull out and provide to people, but while I'm looking for it, uh, Brandon, do you think that regulation is the answer as far as uh, providing a framework of how these decisions should be made? Well, you know, what's surprising to me in a way is I, I don't have strong feelings about this yet. I think it's, it's just a, a really nebulous concept. And since we don't know exactly what the right to be forgotten entails, one interesting question is then who decides what it entails? And, and from the point of view of someone who works a lot on IP policy, and uh, I know that that letting Google decide things is not generally a popular concept in Europe. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so it's a little bit ironic to me that, that what the result of this case is that a bunch of people from Google are sitting around all day deciding what privacy is and which, which people's privacy gets protected and, and which doesn't. Um, I would think that Europe can't stand that for long um, and that some regulation would have to be formulated to take that power away from Google and put it into the hands of somebody that they trust. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Here's the other stat. Google has agreed to remove 35% of the links submitted and declined to remove 50% with 15% still under review. So, and this is an ongoing process. Um, all right, well, we will uh, have to see how that develops. And I tend to agree with you, Gus, that, that this may be the future of the internet. So it's worth paying, to atten uh, paying attention to. Um, something else that uh, caught my eye over the last week or so, uh, it, also on the privacy front, is this woman in California who um, has been fired from her job because she refused to use an app and she uninstalled it uh, that her employer required her to run constantly on her company issued iPhone. And what this app did was uh, track her around all the time uh, during work hours, off work hours. Um, her name is Myrna Arias and uh, she worked for a company called Intermex, um, a money transfer service uh, in central California. 
And uh, when she deinstalled this tracking app, she was fired. So she is suing, um, claiming that the company uh, invaded her privacy, um, that this was in retaliation. I'm not sure for what. I'm, I'm not sure there are many um, retaliation cases on the books that would relate to um, uninstalling an app, <laughs> um, <laughs> unfair business practices, uh, and various other allegations. Um, so to f finish teeing up this story, I think it's an interesting claim. Um, there's a lot of sympathy, I think, that uh, the plaintiff will have in this case, but that sympathy will run up against uh, the whole at-will employee doctrine that, you know, if you don't <laughs> like your working conditions, you don't like what your uh, employer is requiring you um, to do in the way of compliance, then you can take a hike. Um, and the employers have a lot of latitude to run their businesses um, as they want and to fire people for all kinds of reasons, as long as they are not um, reasons that uh, involve civil, civil rights violations. Um, the privacy thing is interesting and I'm, I, it will be fun to see where this case goes and if she gets any traction with it. What do you think of this, Gus? Uh, there's a definite creepiness factor in this case. And I worry that when you have creepiness factor cases, it can easily lead to bad law or bad uh, policy as a result. Um, mm -hmm. There could maybe uh, be some unconscionability or some uh, we don't want to enforce this specific contract aspect. It's important to recognize, though, there are probably occupations where this sort of uh, tracking and monitoring could make sense. Um, so we want to make sure that we don't say um, on a reactionary basis, no, this is never going to be allowed. Um, uh, and I think you're exactly right. This is an at-will employment sort of circumstance. Unless this tracking um, or monitoring was being used for some uh, illegal purpose or it was in some way coercive or wasn't disclosed to her um, at the time uh, she uh, uh, was employed, I, I think that uh, we should... Uh, accept that, yeah, this is a technology that's out there. It's creepy. We should be aware of it. Um, and um, we probably should frown on employers using it gratuitously. But so long as employees are made aware of it and aren't um, coerced into it, uh, it's uh, a potentially reasonable and useful technology. The other thing that strikes me about this case is that the employer um, stupidly went and used a third-party app when it was issuing iPhones to its employees. And it could have just used the Find My iPhone feature and the geolocation features that are built into those devices uh, without having to flag for the employees that yeah. they were tracking them everywhere. Of course, you know, that's that could be problematic in its own right. Um, the other super problematic part of the case is is that with the third party app, there were no safeguards in place that um, would allow it to operate only during business hours. And I would love to see the law develop in such a way that if you are going to track your employees around, there would be some sort of reasonable restrictions on your ability to do that. Uh, Brandon, anything further to add? I'm, I'm with you, Denise. I think there needs to be regulation to protect worker privacy here. But it also strikes me as almost like a a parable or something for, you know, aren't we all always being followed around by our work in our, in our phone because of our freaking <laughs> email, right? I mean, yes. like, I feel like I am, I am answering student emails all weekend long. I am, I am responding to, to stuff. So, you know, it's like, let's just make that explicit and completely unambiguous. We will literally track you um, instead of just figuratively tracking you. Right. Sarah, anything to add? Uh, no, I'm definitely on the side of this seems really crazy. Um, it seems like it has to violate some employment laws, especially in California. I forget. If, is that where the case was? I yes, don't remember. it is in okay. California. Um, California has uh, some of the best employment, well, employee friendly, I guess, uh, labor laws. But I mean, I, yes, it's an at, at will employee situation, but I, it seems like a public policy issue um, in some ways because, you know, do potential candidates for these jobs really have the negotiating power and and is is there really a reasonable connection to the business practice you know that they need this level of 24/7 tracking that seems hard to imagine so i guess i'm also i'm inclined to think that this is the type of thing that we need regulation for 
in some regard. Right. But then, I mean, how, how do you deal with, suppose that there is regulation over um, how you can track your employees, um, then consider the situation where an employer wants to give the employees iPhones and wants to use the tracking feature that's already built in some of the time. It's, it seems like it just might not be possible um, to tailor it, you know, because the device isn't designed that way. That's true. But does the employer necessarily have to get, be the one getting the data? Like for the Find My iPhone, doesn't it just go to Apple, the data, and then you can get it if the person who has the iPhone gets it if they need it? Or, I mean, it, I don't know. It seems like you could imagine ways to tailor it. But, yeah. but on the other hand, legislation often... <laughs> Gets, it gets screwy when they try to regulate these sorts of things. So I can also imagine right. doomsday scenarios, but... Yes, yeah, and that's, that's, that's what we do here. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's why lawyers are so happy. That's right. <laughs> we can imagine scenarios so easily. Yeah, and this case um, demonstrates one of the challenging issues of new technologies. Technology is generally black and white. It does not have the ability to exercise human judgment. And probably any regulation, any law um, written to govern this sort of technology would have some judgment aspect. It would have some safety valves. It would uh, have some permissibility for um, uh, monitoring uh, security individuals or uh, people in positions of public trust or what's not. Um, it would uh, possibly have some provision for employees being able to disable uh, the technology under reasonable circumstances. Well, who decides what reasonable is? Who decides what uh, jobs get in, put into any of these categories? The technology can't do that. So fundamentally, this needs to be pushed to some decision maker, which guarantees, uh, to end with the punchline, that lawyers are going to be employed in this area for a long time uh, to come. <laughs> Yay. All right. No. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Yay. Um, let, we're going to talk about stuff, different stuff on a plane uh, in a moment here. But first, we're going to thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law. And this episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by FreshBooks. It's amazing how many lawyers I know who spend way too much time practicing paperwork rather than practicing their actual legal profession. On top of their piles of affidavits and case files, there are billable hours that need tracking, expenses to manage, and client invoices to prepare and send. FreshBooks makes all that so much easier. Uh, I use FreshBooks in my own law practice and literally could not have the practice that I have without FreshBooks because it enables me to be completely independent. I don't need the overhead of a staff. Um, I don't need the overhead of an assistant. I can very readily uh, in just a few clicks capture uh, all the time and expenses that I need to um, get bills out to clients, get paid. That's all you want as a lawyer, right? Just to turn things around or as any business person, of course, in a, in a very convenient, very fast, very accurate and very professional way. Uh, FreshBooks is a super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of lawyers uh, like me and you, if you're a lawyer listening, uh, the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. It lets you create and send super slick invoices online in minutes. You're going to track your time effortlessly because for one thing, there's a mobile app that you can use to track your billable hours from anywhere. Uh, and those mobile apps help you organize things like receipts when you're running around between the office, a client meeting, the courthouse, et cetera. And if you ever have questions about using the app, there's an award-winning FreshBooks support team of rock stars who are waiting for you. There's a real live person on the other end of the phone every time you call to give you a hand. Getting started is simple and it's totally free for 30 days with no obligation. Go to freshbooks.com slash twill and don't forget to enter twill, T-W-I-L, when they ask how you heard about us. Helps us out. Uh, let's FreshBooks know that uh, it's worthwhile to advertise on this show. We hope that they think so and you will give their product a try because it's a wonderful piece of work. We thank FreshBooks for supporting this episode of This Week in Law. All right, let's move on and talk about stuff on a plane. Uh, hacking planes, always something that, that gets people up in arms uh, and a crime that is worth considering. Uh, 
Um, so I guess uh, Ethernet's on the plane is how Gus put this uh, in teeing up the story, uh, suggesting that we talk about it today. Uh, there is a security researcher uh, named Chris Roberts who um, is uh, thought to have perhaps maybe plugged into the entertainment system, the in-flight entertainment system on a number of airplanes. Uh, the FBI um, issued a public warrant that included some comments that indicate that uh, Mr. Roberts at least said that he was going to um, exploit or gain access to the in, uh, in-flight entertainment system by plugging in an ethernet cable uh, through the seat electronic box under his passenger seat. Um, sounds a bit kludgy and strange, but uh, security researcher Chris Roberts um, at least initially said that he um, was controlling one of the engines on a plane this way. He seems to have backed off these comments now and said, oh, no, 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 everything I've said, everything in that warrant was taken out of context. Um, so obviously it's problematic if people are plugging their ethernet cable uh, into their lap laptop and then into the in-flight entertainment system and starting to fly the plane. Um, Gus, do you want to uh, add anything further to this? Uh, so I, I shouldn't say things quite this directly, but uh, this guy was just stupid. Um, he, he tweeted <laughs> things to the effect that he had um, taken control or interfaced with uh, the in-flight control systems by interfacing with the in-flight entertainment system um, and used that to change the throttle control on one of the engines uh, causing the plane to turn. Who knows whether or not this is actually true. Part of the fascinating thing here is the FBI, understandably, is taking this very seriously. Um, uh, how this relates to the uh, general rhetoric of um, the cybersecurity sphere is fascinating. Um, a few weeks ago, I guess at this point, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, the FAA had issued a notice um, saying uh, that it was possible that in-flight in entertainment systems weren't sufficiently firewalled from the flight control systems such that just this sort of thing could happen. And then a couple later, um, we have this guy saying, hey, I actually did this. And he knows the lingo. He knows the relevant terminology. Um, so he has some credibility in saying that he did this. Um, and when the FAA bulletin was released, um, my colleagues and I, folks in the cybersecurity community I was speaking with, they all said, that's stupid. The FAA is just being alarmist. There's no way this could actually happen. These guys don't understand cybersecurity. They're just trying to scare us. Well, maybe there was actually something to this, which is pretty scary. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Um, Sarah or Brandon, any thoughts other than hacking planes bad? <laughs> no, that's my really my actually my only thought mm. is that this is a potentially really scary story, but it sounds like maybe there's a little more to it. But yeah, nothing else. Scary sounds a little bit scary. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Reddit. hacking planes. Hacking planes is bad. Um, yeah, <laughs> this might be kind. Of, it's it, it. sort of seems like uh, like security around airplanes in general is one place where I'm okay overreacting. You know, if somebody says the <laughs> word bomb in an airport, get them get them out of the airport. You know, I'm okay with that. Uh, so I think this this guy appears to be just sort of um, a wannabe, but ooh. Man, just even the thought of it. I don't like to fly anyway, but this is worse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Something a little less disturbing, but still could be problematic for you, involves um, things that you th might think would uh, be involved in your customer agreement with an airplane or its official stated policies, but it's actually not. It, it perhaps should be in the terms of service. Uh, but it could come back to bite you even though it's not there. Um, we're going to look at this in one other story related to um, what's in the fine print. Sticking with our airplane theme, I think that was a, a supersonic jet just uh, zooming away from our bumper there. Um, there's a great article uh, that discusses, and you can get to this and all the other pieces that we've been discussing on the show today in our delicious links for the show at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 304. Um, this particular piece talks about 
taking pictures uh, in and around airplanes, in um, in airports, on planes, et cetera. And what you might think is that there would be some kind of published prohibition against that. And it turns out that there's not. Uh, but with a number of people having been asked to um, refrain from taking pictures or being told by uh, airline employees that they needed to stop videoing or photographing some particular thing on the airline, um, with a little bit of digging, it turns out that um, although the airlines don't publish prohibitions against um, where you can take pictures and such, they do authorize their employees uh, to stop passengers from taking pictures in, in their internal policies. Um, JetBlue says our crew members use their professional judgment in evaluating the appropriate use of photography or videography on board, especially when it involves the privacy of other customers and the safe and secure operations of the airline. So um, some people who have said, you know, I thought I could take pictures anywhere. Um, it turns out that uh, air, airlines don't really see it that way. And and who wants to tangle? It's It's sort of like, uh, <laughs> what Brandon was saying earlier about uh, just don't touch music, man. You just don't want to mess with those flight crews um, because if if you know they want to throw you out of, off the plane, well, presumably not in flight, but uh, <laughs> out of out of out of your uh, travel arrangements, out of the airport, etc. They can readily do so. Um, so it's something to just be aware of, and it's something um, that of course, will continue to um, magnify in scope as more and more people have more and more electronics on planes and, you know, between body cameras and everything else, we may get to uh, a point where uh, things are being filmed or photographed um, just sort of as a matter of routine. Uh, so it, it, it seems like uh, the goals of the airlines and the um, abilities of the technologies available to people are at odds on this. Um, Sarah, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm kind of okay with, in general, um, with the way that they're dealing with this by having humans use their professional judgment. Although I, mm -hmm. of course, there are going to be situations where flight crews have different, you know, there'll be some crazy enforcement out there. But planes are a situation where um, it, it's private property, but it feels public. It's almost like, you know, having a rule at the mall where you can't use your cameras or take pictures. That would feel crazy. And I think that same situation goes for, for airplanes and airports. But at the same time, um, you don't want the person sitting next to you on the airplane. You're already sitting close enough. So it feels like there's an invasion of personal privacy. But, you know, if they started taping you, um, you can imagine that you would want to be able to go to the flight crew and say, hey, you know, this person has their their phone pointed at my face. Um, so, in general, uh, it seems like you know the kind of the right policy. Maybe it'd be nice to have more rules that people actually know about and understand what the parameters are. Right. But I'm not surprised yeah. that they have rules against it. Yeah, Brandon, so, would you expect to see uh, more written policies for passengers along these lines? Uh, you know, I would think so, and it's interesting. You know, it makes me think of Eric Garner and some of the body cam discussions that we have about police officers and the right to the right to videotape police officers, um, which I'm I'm proud our Washington D.C. chief of police has said very strongly that all of her officers should respect the the rights of the public to tape them while they're doing their duty, and of course, right? I mean, the flight crew are not police officers. But in some sense, the concern may be the same. That is, the story in the in the link and uh, the rundown from LinkedIn explains that you know they were kicking people off the flight sometimes for taping what what the consumer thought was bad behavior by the flight crew, mm -hmm. and so you could imagine some bullying behavior going on there under the pretense of security. Um, this might be something that you could put, for example, in the airline passengers bill of rights. Uh, type of uh, regulation, you know, that, that a passenger should have a right to reasonably video record out the window or things happening in the cabin. And then that would at least give you sort of a, a, a venue or a rule that you could cite to in disputing the airline rather than the airline being in total control. 
Yeah, I can't, I, all of this made me think of all the times too that someone has burst into song on an air, airplane. You know, there are all kinds of viral videos that have mm -hmm. um, originated within the cabin of an airplane. And uh, it would certainly um, chill those kinds of things um, if the flight crew were constantly telling you to turn off your phone. Um, Gus, is this a situation of, you know, my airplane, my rules, you go fly someone else if you don't like what our flight crews do? So I, I want to echo what Brandon said. Um, mm -hmm. There is a, a real concern here that this could be used uh, to protect employees who are acting badly. Another mm -hmm. uh, more serious, I think, concern that I have is this can be used for pretextual profiling and making racist decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when you put this much discretion into the hands of uh, the employees, it can be problematic. That said, it, it def there definitely is a place for it, and I'm not sure where to draw the line. And I'm going to do something that could be ill-advised. I'm going to show you, I don't know if you can see this. This is my uh, Facebook page. I fly a lot. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I enjoy flying. And this is a, a picture of an airplane uh, at a gate at Chicago O'Hare while I was waiting to uh, take off. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, scary to think that I could have been kicked off the plane or possibly arrested for taking that photo. Um, but uh, that's what the rule is. Um, uh, so the, the question is, where do we locate the discretion? How do we monitor that it's not being abused? And perhaps in the long term, with all the new monitoring technology um, and uh, a pervasive uh, ability to record, um, will I be able to have my selfie drone following me around the airport taking pictures of me? Um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can you imagine the the Lily cameras following all of us through the airport onto the plane, <laughs> hovering over our heads? <laughs> oh God! And yes. I, I totally sympathize with Gus too. I I fly a fair amount, and my son loves airplanes, and so like part of the ritual of my flying is I take a picture out the window when I can of my airplane and send it, text it to my wife to show my son. You know, it's Dad's airplane. I had no idea that this might get kick, get me kicked off my flight. It's kind of terrifying. Um, I might stop doing that. <laughs> yes. Well, at least uh, do it do it with a little more caution. Uh, we'll make over lillying our second MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. Where I'm referring to that uh, camera we discussed last week, the Lily camera, uh, that will follow you around and uh, take pictures of you. Not available yet, thank goodness. Um, we'll, I can't can't wait to see uh, what sort of um, societal upheaval that little device rots once it, they start floating around after people. Um, I think that we're going to have to move on to our resource and tip of the week as we are running low on time here at the end of the show. We had much more to discuss. We're just going to have to have Brandon and Gus come back with us soon and, and get to some of our other topics that we're going to leave on the shelf for today. Will you guys promise to do that? Uh, gladly. Absolutely. Okay, great. Then, then I can happily go on to our tip and resource of the week. Our uh, tip of the week um, is, and I'm, I'm maybe uh, presenting it with a question mark. I, I originally was going to present it with make your kid read privacy policies. Uh, but now I'm going to present it as maybe just something to think about. Make your kid read privacy policies because um, <laughs> this relates to an article uh, by Nicole Wong. Uh, Nicole is a former counsel for Google. She was a deputy CTO for the White House and she has a great piece uh, in the Christian Science Monitor, um, talking about her family policies and uh, how um, she has decided as a parent that her children, before they will download any apps, uh, will read the privacy policy. So the sort of hysterical uh, consequence of that is her very first uh, public tweet from her daughter um, talked about her most hated things, and um, some of the things on there are very lawyerly in nature. And one of them are privacy policies. And presumably this is because <laughs> mom Nicole says she has to read the privacy policies. So the three rules actually in their family are you have to read the privacy policy before you create an account or download an app. You have to explain to mom what gets shared and with whom and mom and dad have final say. These are awesome, awesome rules. But goodness, I, I hope that... Um, the, they do not instill such hatred in privacy policies that maybe 
uh, they are read well under mom and dad's roof and then never again in life <laughs> because <laughs> they, uh, it, these are definitely um, worthy things to um, know about and have kids know about. So um, I will toss it out as, as uh, for all of the parents in the audience. Uh, use your own judgment. I think um, making kids read privacy policies probably from time to time so they understand what's going on uh, is a good idea and, and uh, making sure that um, if there are apps that your kids are using that uh, you can tell involve a lot of um, shared information that may be emphasizing that those are the ones that they really need to slog through the fine print and read. Um, anybody else have, you know, what do you think about Nicole's uh, strategy here, Gus? Uh, it sounds like a great way to either make kids want to go to law school or want to avoid law school like the plague. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I think anything uh, more seriously that uh, gets people generally uh, aware that there are these terms and conditions, that there are contracts out there, that there are legal rules out there governing uh, a lot of their conduct, uh, even things that seem completely reasonable, um, is good. Um, whether or not those rules are themselves reasonable or that's how uh, we want the world that we live in to look, uh, that's a different question. But we're only going to really be able to uh, seriously answer that question if we have people who are informed and understand uh, that this is the world that we live in. So uh, in that sense, this might not be the best way to instill that sort of knowledge and understanding, but it is a way. Uh, so I, I applaud it for that. Brandon, you going to make your kids start reading privacy policies? Uh, you know, privacy or terms of use in EULAs, I mean, certainly from the copyright context, I'm afraid my kids may never own any media, so they, they should know what all the licenses are that govern all the media that they are privileged to access on a temporary basis. <laughs> right. Sarah, from a Creative Commons uh, perspective, maybe um, there needs to be a, a business out there that translates privacy policies and EULAs into kid readable form. Yeah, actually, I really like that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and something we've talked about before. I, my reaction when I read uh, the article about Nicole Wong was I used to feel sorry for my son for having two lawyers as parents, but now I feel <laughs> like I don't feel that bad for him. At least I'm not going to make him read privacy policies in terms of use. I do enough of that at work and it's, it's brutal. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe the All rule right, should be if you're if a kid can't understand the rules, then he can't be bound by them. How about that? Yes. Yes. Uh, that uh, I just want to see a privacy policy in picture book form. <laughs> oh God! You know someone's going to do that, Gus. I, I think as, I, we've seen him in game form before. So. Uh, and I think that might be the only thing that might get traction in our household is uh, if it were. Um, housed in halo armor, <laughs> then it might be taken in. Um, okay, our resource of the week uh, has to do with, again, reading EULAs and uh, privacy policies. And while you might not want to make your kids read them, um, I think as responsible adults, you definitely have to be careful, especially um, with photography. Uh, we have a couple of links along these lines. Uh, number one uh, is the saga of a woman uh, who, she is a photographer, Nikki Mede Guardiacione. I'm sure I'm butchering her last name. Um, but she um, is a wedding photographer and she posted a, a watermarked picture that she had taken on, at someone's wedding um, of uh, the bride looking feisty and the groomsmen all drinking um, some form of light beer, Miller Lite. Uh, the Miller Lite people reached out to her and uh, on Facebook. So this is all, the conversation is all happening in the Facebook comments sections or maybe in the message section. Um, in any event, on Facebook, they are communicating with her and asking her for permission to share her photo, uh, which she very logically decides means, oh, well, they're asking to share it on their page. And they're, they're very specific. We're not going to pay you. This is for the pride of having our, us share the photo. Uh, but, um, you know, we're not going to pay you. And she says, okay, well, sure. I'd love to have you share it. Would you mind, you know, um, giving a shout out to my photography site on Facebook or my website or my Twitter or Instagram? Um, you know, thanks for reaching out to me. That'd be great. 
Uh, but it turns out that what they were actually asking her for was to be able to use the picture in a television commercial. Uh, I sense Don Draper uh, coming in on the sides here. And uh, she um, she just jumped all over him and said, um, well, no, uh, you're being misleading here. Sharing with fans is completely different than um, using a photo without a credit or compensation in a multi-million dollar television ad campaign. Uh, so go away. And uh, they did. <laughs> so uh, beware of brands uh, making strange requests on Facebook there. Um, good resource for you there. And also um, a Fast Company article that discusses, uh, you remember a few weeks ago, the um, uh, age guessing tool that was making the round, howold.net, uh, with people uploading their pictures and seeing uh, if they looked like they were 78 years old or not. Um, the uh, fine print there included uh, language much like you would see in uh, just about any kind of internet site where you are offering information, uh, granting Microsoft a license, a, a non-exclusive license um, to use, whatever you submit to them. Uh, this got a lot of people riled up. Uh, Microsoft came in and said, oh, no, 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 no. We're, no we're not going to use your stuff that way, but you should be aware that those are the terms of service. They are accurate. However, the developers of this particular tool have decided um, not to store or share any of the photos that are being um, used for that app. So um, this cautionary tale is, you know, the although um, people were right to be concerned that Microsoft could uh, definitely use the photos in accordance with its terms of service. Um, in this particular instance, it said, but we're not going to. Um, so always good to be aware of what those terms say and what you're giving up when you're uploading photos. Uh, folks, this has been a really, really fun show. I've enjoyed every aspect of it, really enjoyed our conversations today and uh, learned a lot. Gus Hurwitz, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, and I hope to do it again. I know, you, you guys have promised, so uh, we'll be hitting you up again soon because uh, we left a lot on the table here. I cannot believe we got through a show with you guests without discussing net neutrality, but that issue is not going away and we will have you back. It's definitely oh. not going anywhere, so we'll, we'll have yeah. plenty of time to talk about it. Great, <laughs> wonderful. Brandon Butler, thanks so much for joining us again. Absolutely, it was my pleasure. And Did you get Sarah, out the beer yet, Brandon? Oh, yes. It's, it's coming. It's in the fridge. I'm headed that way. <laughs> nice. Make it a Miller Lite, maybe, in honor of uh, one of our resources. Or don't, in honor of yeah. that particular resource. <laughs> hey, Sarah, it's been great to chat with you. Yeah, thanks so much. It's lots of fun, as always. Uh, so, folks, you should, if you've enjoyed this show, you should join us every week. We do it every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific Time, 1800 UTC. That's when we record live. Uh, and if you can't catch us live, don't worry about it because it's available on demand for your viewing and listening pleasure whenever you would like at twit.tv slash twill. We have a YouTube page. We are on Roku. If you go to that twit.tv slash twill page, there's all kinds of information um, about how you can enjoy the show at your leisure and subscribe in whatever way that you would like. Uh, we love hearing from you between the shows. It's really helpful for us to um, learn of guests that you think we should invite on, learn of topics that you think we should be covering. You can email Sarah. She's Sarah P at twit.tv. I'm Denise at twit.tv. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Google Plus or on Facebook. Uh, all great places to get in touch. Let us know your feedback and suggestions for the show. And uh, we hope you'll join us again next week on This Week in Law. Take care. <laughs>